I'm Ed Rabitsky. I'm going to be talking about biofarming. And what I mean by that is biological farming. I'm a genetic engineer, and I say this proudly because it's a good thing, and I'll show you why. What if there were a way to make complex pharmaceuticals inexpensive? And what if we could do it right here in Cape Town, and in fact in Africa in general? Now I'm going to answer these two questions and hopefully also introduce you to a, generally dis a genuinely disruptive technology that has already touched a few of your lives, possibly, because there's 800 odd people here, but will almost definitely touch your lives in the near future. Biologics are big pharma's next frontier. They are the next big thing coming out of big pharma. These are big, complicated molecules that are, can only be made in living systems. And by that, I mean bacteria, yeast, animal cells, and in fact, whole organisms. They used to make human growth hormone from cadavers, from dead bodies. Now, the thing about these is that they are big and complicated. They're proteins, sugars, nucleic acids, or complex combinations of these which means that they're often difficult and generally expensive to produce. And that's especially the proteins, because proteins are big and complicated. But there's a lot of them in use already. For example, proteins used for enzyme replacement therapy. People with genetic diseases often need supplementary enzymes, and they need it lifelong. Proteins used as subunit vaccines. Hepatitis B was one of the first blockbuster vaccines like this. The next on the block was the human papillomavirus vaccines. Two vaccines, each of them sell about a billion dollars worth a year. Monoclonal antibodies, used for things like cancer and chronic disease therapy. They're using an antibody called Herceptin for breast cancer therapy. People with specific kinds of rheumatoid arthritis can get therapy from an anti-TNF-alpha antibody, monoclonal antibody, that again, they have to take lifelong. And the thing about these therapies is that they are expensive. The rheumatoid arthritis therapy can be a couple of hundred thousand rand a year. And I know at least two people in my acquaintance who are actually on this therapy right now for the rest of their lives, which gives you this figure over here, biologic sales are expected to reach 240 billion US dollars by 2015. It is going to be an enormous market. And they're made like this, large amounts of stainless steel, people in white coats, everything sterile. A plant like that to make something like a monoclonal antibody costs a minimum of about 100 million US dollars. You then have to feed those cells that you're producing by, with complex and expensive media. So it's expensive to set up, it's costly to run, and it's costly to maintain. So this is where you get, can we do this differently? And yes, we most certainly can. Like that. That is the new factory. That's transgenic tobacco. <laughs> That's transgenic tobacco growing in an institute in Germany. These guys are growing HIV monoclonal antibodies, anti-HIV antibodies in plants, as a microbicide, because it turns out that the only way you can use a monoclonal antibody as an HIV microbicide is if you can make enormous quantities and if you can make them cheap, because you need a lot of them. This is the only technology that will allow that. This is the heart of that technology. This is the humble plant cell. The wonderful thing about plants is that they are as complicated as yeast or mammalian cells, but they have internal bacteria that act as batteries. Those things. Chloroplasts. Chloroplasts take light, carbon dioxide, and water, and they convert it into sugars. You just have to provide really simple ingredients and shine a light on a plant, and it produces complex chemicals. So, and I'll brush over this nice and quickly because it's way too complicated to even remotely discuss in this time. DNA coding for protein. 
You put it into a plant by classical genetic engineering techniques that we've had for 30 years, or another revolutionary technology that's only been around for less than 10, and that is take a whole plant, dip it in a suspension of bacteria that put DNA into it, and five days later you can make protein. That's taking plants grown outside in a field that are not transgenic, putting bacteria into them and taking protein out of them in about five days. That is the new part of the technology. This is the old part of the technology. You do this when you make apple juice. Crush plants, get a juice out of them. If that juice then contains high-value pharmaceuticals, you formulate it for injection or for oral dosing. That's what this technology allows, potentially, because you need a lot more protein to dose orally rather than mainlining it, and you can make it by this technology. Formulate for injection or oral dosing and stick it into people and or animals. There, there's another wonderful new technology, vertical farming. This is, and I saw this literally just a couple of weeks ago, it's the world's biggest plant factory in Japan. They produce, with all this high tech, lettuces. They produce 10,000 heads of lettuce a day for the Japanese market. If you can use a technology like this to make something that you can eat as a salad, imagine the saving in terms of making biological mass to make pharmaceuticals with, compared to enormous tanks of stainless steel that would just about fill this room. And that's the main reason for what we call molecular farming. The cost of plant production is estimated at around 100 to 1,000 fold less than animal cell production. Monoclonal antibodies are typically made in animal cells right now. And 10 to 100 fold less than bacterial or yeast production. The human papillomavirus vaccine, for example, one of them is made in yeast cells. Insulin can be made in bacteria, so can human growth hormone. And just as an illustration, this is an infinitely scalable technique. You do not need to spend $100 million to build the minimum size plant. I could farm with a pH with an area the size of the stage and produce grams of active pharmaceutical ingredient. Or I could go to a big greenhouse and produce many grams of API. Or I could go to the open field if you're using transgenic plants literally hectares. You can get greenhouses that cover a couple of hectares that exist for the purpose of providing cut flowers to the European market. If you can do that, you could grow tobacco under glass and make pharmaceuticals out of it for next to nothing. And here's a, here's a success. Anybody, and the odds are reasonably high that there's a couple of people in this room with Gaucher disease. It's a mitochondrial enzyme deficit. It means you accumulate lipids in cells that you can't get rid of, and it's got a couple of nasty side effects. It can be completely rectified, or almost completely rectified, by enzyme replacement therapy, adding in the enzyme again. And this was a major success story of recent years because the only product on the market, when this thing was in its final stages of human clinical trial, was this thing because two existing factories making the same enzyme out of animal cells on either side of the Atlantic both fell over at the same time due to contamination with mammalian virus. That can't happen with plant cells. Nothing that infects a plant can infect you except certain very rare bacteria. So that technology basically saved everybody with Gaucher disease because they did an accelerated approval. The Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. did an accelerated approval of this, which is now on the open market. Here's another one. The technology I talked about earlier, the tobacco-making monoclonals. There's an institute in Germany, the Fraunhofer Institute in Aachen, have gone all the way through to early-stage clinical trial on the antibody, anti-HIV antibody made in tobacco plants. They have a completely approved process to make pharmaceutical grade monoclonal antibodies. And the point of that is that they can make it cheap enough for it to go into a microbicide. It's not through human trial yet, but it's, it's getting there. 
my favorite virus. I've had a love affair with Ebola going since 1995 when the Kikwit epidemic hit and we were producing the first web pages at UCT. The first web page at UCT that got any hits at all was an Ebola web page. Ebola is an absolutely wonderful virus for a number of ways, and a number of reasons, because it is completely and utterly unpredictable, it'll pop up anywhere it feels like, from far west Africa to southern Congo to Uganda. Because it flies around in the shape of bats, and, and I promised I was going to give you one of those numerical anecdotes at this point, if you laid every single virus particle on this planet, and they're about the same length as Ebola virus, which is about 10 times smaller than a bacterial cell. If you laid every single virus particle on the planet end to end, have you any idea how far that would go? It beats his Earth to the sun completely flat. <laughs> 160 million light years. There are that many virus particles on this planet. And one of them, that one, is now totally out of control. The epidemic in West Africa has taken in four countries now because it is, looks like it's established in Nigeria. It's the deadliest ever seen. And to put this into perspective, the sum total of people who've died through recorded history of Ebola is less than the number who die of influenza every year. But it kills up to 80% of those it infects and it's completely unpredictable. And it hits healthcare workers. So what have they done about it? Well, nothing. There is nothing you can do about Ebola right now, not legally and not ethically. But plant-made antibodies will almost certainly come to the rescue next time, because in this instance, as for the LLISO, two US healthcare workers who contracted Ebola in Liberia and were given an experimental therapy made by a small American um, biotech company allied with a Canadian company, made by Kentucky Bioprocessing, which I mentioned just now. They made a clinical grade batch for clinical trial of a cocktail that works really, really well in monkeys. And if I were a monkey and I saw somebody coming at me with a syringe full of Ebola, I'd be praying that I was in the experimental arm and not the control arm, because this thing saves monkeys and it may have saved two out of three of the people that it was put into. And it's an incredibly effective way of making that therapy, but we don't know whether it works or not because we haven't had a full-scale human trial. But rest assured, on the basis of these results, it will be happening sometime soon. The last success story I'll talk about is a company that I actually have ties to. We sold them technology for doing exactly this, making influenza vaccine in plants. They were successful enough with influenza that they won an enormous trial in the US, hundreds of millions of dollars put into a four-way runoff to see who could make 10 million doses of influenza vaccine in one month, bearing in mind that flu vaccine is over 80 years old right now and it takes six months to make it for the seasonal vaccines that we don't get enough of these days. These guys can make it in a month, they get three times better potency than the standard vaccine, because, which is still made in hen's eggs, as it happens. And it looks like this may be the next blockbuster that comes out of plants. And can we in Cape Town? Well, the answer is we have been for the last 17 years. We started with human papillomaviruses, because my good wife said to me, why don't you do something useful? And they weren't giving me any money to work on plant viruses, so I started working on that and have been doing it ever since. HIV, we've worked on avian and human influenzas, we've worked on human rotavirus, blue tongue virus of sheep, and on. But what we're most proud of is just in a couple of years, after a conference here in Cape Town, where somebody from the WHO said, when the next pandemic hits, you guys are on your own. You will not get vaccines. Fast forward to 2009, and lo, the only vaccine that was available in Cape Town was available in 2010, and for World Cup staff only. Nobody gave us any vaccine for the general population. We did an emergency response um, vaccine preparedness 
set up where we think we've got it cracked. We developed technology we actually sold to a Canadian biotech company that is developing this further. We've done novel papillomavirus vaccines. The current vaccines only cover four types of virus. We've got candidate vaccines that will go a lot wider than that and made in plants to boot. We've assisted a bunch of Europeans and Brits in a European FP7 project on making blue tongue vaccine. Blue tongue is an emerging disease in Europe. They're scared of the live vaccines they use in Africa, so they want subunit vaccines. This could be the way to make them because it works. To everybody's huge surprise, you can make a complicated vaccine in plants that is as good as a conventional vaccine. And this just published this year, we've got a candidate cervical cancer therapy vaccine. Now I say candidate, it works in a mouse model. It works really well in a mouse model, but that mice are very, very far from people. But it's a step along the way. If we can get more money to develop this thing, we'll be trying to make batches of it for human trial. Again, here in Cape Town. So, yes, we can make stuff cheaply. Yes, we can do it in Cape Town. But if I didn't have this crew of people behind me, the biofarming research unit, University of Cape Town, we wouldn't have done anything. So I thank them and I thank you. Thank you.